It's my great honour to welcome you all. It is a very prestigious award. It means the world to me. They have great senses of humour. I like to reveal parts of history to them for I love making history come alive. They are some of the best people that you can come across. To help them open their hearts. I always come back to this quote. How can we be role models to learners if we're not learners ourselves? It's quite useful to get out of our bubbles, not our COVID ones, and sort of see what else is out there. By sharing best practice, we can see the whole picture. We can see what really matters. to forget how much has to happen behind the front line.
As a global schools group, Cognita educates over 55,000 students across 12 countries. We're proud to be Wellbeing Partner at this year's Festival of Education, and we want to share the work that we're doing to prioritise children's wellbeing. This starts with a clear understanding of what wellbeing is. We looked at the evidence and created a simple Be Well Charter that everyone can use day to day. It gives a clear definition of well-being and then focuses on the specific contributors that influence it. Discover our full Be Well Charter video and other resources to use with your students and families at cognita.com. I really try to not look at myself as just a science teacher. I feel like as a teacher, it's, it's very important to help students grow and develop outside of your lessons a single teacher believing in you and really believing in you. One teacher doing that can have a large impact, but if you have one or two or three all telling you that and really, really believing in it, it makes you feel like you can achieve anything in the world, honestly. Welcome to this Festival of Education keynote session, part of the annual Festival of Education, taking place online from the 16th to the 30th of June. This year's festival is free for all teachers and educationalists across education in the UK and beyond. This has only been possible thanks to the support of our incredible partners. A huge thank you to our headline partner, Pearson. Our festival partners, BBC Bite Size, Cognita and Teach First. Our literary festival partner, Bloomsbury Publishing, and our organising partner, Wellington College, the home of the Festival of Education. We'd also like to thank our incredible speakers. Over 200 leading educationalists and thought leaders will be providing sessions at this year's festival. On behalf of the audience and organisers, thank you. It's time to sit back and get set for our upcoming keynote session. If you wish to ask a question during this session, please head over to our Slido page to submit questions and vote for your favourites. Enjoy this Festival of Education keynote session. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ian Henderson. I'm co-director, along with Shane Mann, of the Festival of Education. Um, we hope you've enjoyed our first ever online festival so far and that you continue to do so right to the end on Wednesday. It gives me enormous pleasure to be able to introduce to you Professor Guy Claxton. Where do I start? An extraordinary track record of the highest quality research and writing in education speaks for itself. Professor Claxton is deservedly one of the people to whom we should listen most regarding teaching. I'm especially interested in what he has to say today about the rich middle ground separating the opposite poles of the sometimes toxic binary debate in education. If you have questions or comments, please add them to Slido according to the on-screen instructions um, using the hashtag EducationFest. I hope there'll be a chance to answer and discuss some of them at the end. I don't want to take up any more of your time when Guy has a lot more useful and interesting things to say than, so, than I have, 
So please enjoy the next hour. Over to you, Guy. Yeah, I'm just getting my presentation up. Yeah. So is that is that working? You got my presentation? Yeah. Yeah. OK, great. Um, well, thank you very much, Ian. Thank you for your kind words. Um, I'm, I'm going to be talking today really around uh, a book that was published um, probably about two or three months ago now called The Future of Teaching and the Myths that Hold It Back, which is really another, another way of paraphrase for my title for this talk uh, today, Rebooting Pedagogy, What's Stopping Us? Um, and my general theme is that there, uh, there is a, a large amount of uh, innovation and experimentation uh, going on in te around teaching, teaching styles, um, in all kinds of different places, countries, different kinds of organizations around the world, from individual classrooms, individual schools, uh, chains of schools, um, national um, uh, ways of uh, uh, exploring um, different kinds of pedagogy, what in so the state of South Australia they call the pedagogical shift, um, big funded research projects, uh, millions of dollars from uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, and so on, uh, new um, national uh, curricula and pedagogical guidelines in oh, um, umpteen countries around the world, um, Singapore, Finland, Ireland, Scotland, Australia, New Zealand, the USA, Canada, uh, you, you name it. Um, and uh, with good reason, um, and I'm just going to say a little bit about the good reason for this, but my concern is that however much good uh, work, good exploration of what a genuinely 21st century pedagogy uh, would look like, um, there's not, there's, there's still way not enough. Um, that there are forces holding back these innovations so that, um, as someone famously once said, the future is already here, but it's very unevenly distributed. It's very patchy. Um, and there, uh, it's a source of some concern to me uh, that, that some, uh, there are some uh, factors which are, um, whether deliberately or not, which are inhibiting the kinds of innovation uh, which, uh, which, which need to be going on. And I think which need to be going on at the grassroots of education in individual schools um, and, uh, and individual classrooms. I don't uh, hold out much optimism for top-down uh, innovation. Um, most governments are, are fond of fine words and quick fixes. Um, and what's needed, I think, will come from uh, the vast majority of teachers who are uh, day by day concerned with how to tweak, shape, um, and improve their pedagogy so that they are achieving um, all the objectives that they would like to achieve for young people. So I just want to say a little bit about um, the, the, the reasons for innovation. Um, and they're, they're multiple. I mean, everybody will have their own different things. There were concerns about the many students who didn't know how to organize their own learning lives and their own learning uh, timetables during lockdown. Um, and a sort of gu guiding question that I think is, is on the lips of many school principals, which is, what can we do now when the kids are back in school so that they are better prepared for self-organized learning when the next lockdown comes? Um, and that's a matter of some concern. The, the need, the urgent and uh, uh, essential need for doing whatever we can to build the disposition for critical thinking, not just the skills of critical thinking, but the inclination to think critically. It's happening in some jurisdictions already. In Finland, six and seven-year-olds uh, can fluently explain to you the difference between disinformation, misinformation, and malinformation. Uh, and they are um, being coached, being trained in all subjects across the curriculum, embedded right across the curriculum. 
in how to be resistant to how to be resistant and critical of uh, many of the dangerous um, and malign uh, forces, uh, sources of knowledge that are around in the world at the moment. Uh, worries about uh, how to provide an education that gives a sense of success and pride to the, uh, depends how you calculate it, 50%, 60%, two thirds of youngsters uh, who are not going to follow an academic track. Um, and that leads us into the, the vexed and prolonged question of the esteeming of practical and vocational um, and how we escape, particularly in the UK, how we escape from this persistent belief that intellectual forms of activity and employment are somehow marked by higher levels of intelligence than practical and vocational forms of occupation, a belief which is unfounded and which is pernicious and which has bl uh, blighted the lives of many tens or hundreds of thousands uh, of young people who are extremely smart with their hands or their voices or their feet, but have left school feeling that somehow or other they're not very clever. Concern with the way in which education contributes to rather than offers uh, a reduction of stress and mental health uh, is obviously a great issue. Um, the vexed issue of how we acknowledge the, the massive way in which learning has been democratized through uh, Web 2.0, Web 1.0, digital resources, smartphones, and so on, um, and an unease that the attempt to try and hold back the tide of uh, digital learning by schools is going to prove as futile as the equivalent attempt of King Canute. And I've, more up my street, particularly I'm going to focus on today, um, the ways in which our understandings of the young mind of the learning mind have been changing in the last perhaps 20 or 15 years uh, to give us new insights and new possibilities, both about learning um, and about teaching. So it seems to me that the case for innovation, uh, for experimentation, for supporting teachers in using their initiative in exploring nuanced and flexible ways uh, of teaching in the classroom uh, are absolutely essential. There's a general feeling that um, everybody wants not just results, that knowledge plus grades are necessary for life, but not sufficient. I don't know of a single school that proudly proclaims on its website, send us your kids, we'll do everything we can by hook or by crook to squeeze the best possible test results out of them and nothing else. There is always some language, some rhetoric about what else we are providing, an introduction to a learning life, preparation for life in a complex time in history or self-reliance or something or other. Uh, and the, my, the list of things uh, on this slide are things that are very commonly uh, spoken about as being part of the plus that are wanted. And I, I talk about results plus because it's very important that we don't fall into the trap, which some people would have us uh, fall into, of seeing grades and knowledge and rigor as somehow in opposition to uh, the development of characteristics like tolerance for uncertainty, the ability to cope well when life is complicated or disappointing or frustrating or confusing on you, development of an entrepreneurial spirit with the rise of digitally based, internet based self employment, the massive uh, leaps in, in that, the growth of, of, of AI and the way that's changing um, uh, employment opportunities, what Google calls very interested in what they call learning agility, the ability to think on your feet. That's to say, to approach problems about which little is known with an open, uh, active, productive kind of intelligence. Uh, assessing information, uh, detecting fake news, the ability to control attention uh, is a source of much concern, the ability to adopt multiple uh, perspectives, whether that's different perspective, different intellectual perspectives or through uh, empathy. The development of intellectual humility uh, is very much an, uh, an issue in the literature that I'm reading. And there is good research which shows that general knowledge, the speed at which people acquire general knowledge, 
um, which is something that is obviously of great importance, is, there is a direct reflection of their intellectual humility, their open-mindedness, their keenness to know more, and their readiness to admit that they don't know much or that there, there's, there's room for improvement. The development of oracy, the development of, of systems thinking, the ability to think about complex matters, um, the development of imagination, the development of the ability to self-organize, um, and so on. George Miller, one of the founders of cognitive psychology, uh, said many, many years ago, we say we want sensitive, thoughtful, analytical, independent scholars, and then treat them like Belgian geese being stuffed with pâté de foie gras. Um, it would not be, that would be results minus, wouldn't it? Uh, rather than results plus. So, as I said, there is a lot going on. These are just, I mean, there are tens, if not hundreds of thousands of schools around the world and jurisdictions that have made massive strides in the, in the direction of developing forms of pedagogy, as well as forms of assessment, forms of curriculum design, but particularly forms of, of pedagogy. Uh, there is a growing recognition from all these different initiatives around the world that the way we teach is at least as important and often more important in terms of developing these attributes or habits of mind, which everybody is agreeing are useful for young people to have. That, that, that they are cultivated in classrooms where there are particular cultures, particular moods, a particular undertow, uh, particular kinds of activities going on. Um, these are just some schools that I've been involved with, my knowledge, Isaac Newton Academy in uh, Northeast London, the Jakarta Intercultural School, ANSA Charter School, one of the lead schools of the EL education chain, uh, expeditionary learning. Uh, schools, XP in Doncaster, another amazing school, St. Luke's in Sydney, in Australia, that I've worked with a lot of independent uh, Christian school, Stonefields Primary School in inner city Auckland. I could go on forever. These are all proof of concept schools showing that it is possible to build broadly, to build character at the same time as transmitting knowledge, secure bodies of knowledge, and supporting youngsters in gaining the best possible grades that they can. Just as one example, the school that I am particularly pleased to have been associated with Isaac Newton in um, uh, Ilford in Northeast London, uh, their um, Ofsted report after they'd been um, embarking on a very explicit, very detailed curriculum pedagogy of developing different aspects of character shown in this large, highly differentiated wheel and uh, developed um, uh, rigorously and monitored rigorously throughout the school through methods that they themselves have developed. Their Ofsted report says students' behavior is exemplary. They have a passion for learning, actively supporting their own and each other's learning as well. The Unique Bridges program, which is this wheel develop students as effective learners, well prepared for the future. So this is a school like many other schools where Results Plus is alive and well. It's a school of very, very mixed demographic, but for the last, I don't know, 16, sorry, large six, six years or so, their GCS results have been consistently in the top 1% in England on Progress 8. So the idea that paying attention to the, develop, the development of more general habits of mind is somehow antithetical or disruptive, or the, uh, the curious idea is around that, that this is somehow de detracts particularly for disadvantaged children, children from disadvantaged or low income families. The idea that they are particularly disadvantaged by schools paying attention to developing these habits of mind is simply uh, not borne out by the proof of concept of these many schools that are around at the moment, but they're still in a small minority. Uh, they're not breeding fast enough. There's not enough uh, spreading, enough um, extrapolation, enough escalation of these kinds of the kinds of pedagogies 
which are being so successfully developed in all different kinds of schools uh, around the world, not just independent schools. So actually, international independent schools have often played a lead uh, in developing these forms of pedagogies, but you find them in inner city uh, secondary schools, primary schools, um, in rural schools, in schools in Patagonia and in rural China and in wherever. So this is this is happening. But there are blocks and barriers. There are log jams, if you like, in the stream of this innovation. And there are many reasons uh, why this might be so. The, uh, a strong adherence by some people to, to resisting looking at what it is that young youngsters really, really do need to know. What, what constitutes practical knowledge, um, powerful knowledge in the sense that it actually demonstrably, reliably empowers them uh, to manage their lives better, to create um, wider opportunities for themselves. Some people are resistant to, uh, to the kind of work, for example, that is beautifully reviewed by David Perkins of Harvard in one of his most recent books called Future Wise, which reviews uh, the nature, the content of the curriculum. Um, but assessment also, the pressure of retention focused uh, exams, high stakes exams, obviously uh, makes a, places a constraint, real or apparent, certainly, on teachers. Narrow conceptions of educational aims, people who insist that the only right and proper uh, aim of education is the transmission of secure and venerable bodies of knowledge which result in good grades and access to uh, high status tertiary or further or higher education. Uh, political um, uh, voices that really have no understanding of the complexity and the nuance of education, but are insist on promoting simplistic approaches, both to teaching and to the curriculum. Um, some people, uh, not only politicians, have a very naive view and, and a, a simplistic view about, about the nature of teaching. And particularly, I would come back to this theme again, some recent dubious applications of cognitive science. And in, in my book, uh, The Future of Teaching and the Myths that Hold It Back, um, I uh, explore in some detail the claims that have been around for um, 10 years or so, um, promoted very strongly, uh, claims that only one form of pedagogy, which is very traditional, which is sort of at the, at, at the extreme end of traditional teaching, only one form of pedagogy is compatible with the fundamental, this is a metaphor that we'll come back to, the fundamental architecture of human cognition. Now, this is a very strong claim, a very powerful claim. Uh, anything that seems to have the imprimatur of science obviously needs to be taken seriously. Uh, but many teachers obviously don't have the time or the training to dig into the underpinnings are of these claims. So they're, um, when they're presented with such um, often quite belligerent, but certainly strong um, assertions of rightness, um, the, the idea that the fundamental architecture of the mind, which is uh, compatible only with one particular corner of the large field of teaching, that this architecture was established beyond question 50 or 60 years ago, and that nothing of any fundamental interest or importance has happened in cognitive science since that model was first originated in 1967 and then uh, developed somewhat in 1974. Uh, these claims are very powerful and they, and I think they're, uh, they are partly to blame for the caution or the timidity that some teachers very understandably have shown in the face of these claims about investigating what Ian called the, the nuanced, flexible, dynamic middle ground, which is where good teaching happens. 
So uh, I want to take a bit of a look to rehearse some of the arguments um, in my book uh, about these claims and to have a look and see what, what some of these claims are and uh, what, what the science has to say about them, really, if you, if you take a contemporary view uh, of cognitive science. I mean, my background is in cognitive science. I work, I write, I publish uh, as a cognitive scientist, particularly in the area of malleable and non-intellectual forms of intelligence. That's my field as a cognitive scientist. Um, and I like to think that I keep up to date with interesting developments or advances in cognitive science. So it grieved me and dismayed me to see what in many people's eyes is a rather antiquated model of the mind being presented as if it were the last word and as if it provided incontrovertible, uh, an incontrovertible argument in favor of directing a particularly uh, strong form of direct instruction, by which I mean, we'll come back to this, but by, by, by which I mean uh, the assertion that explanation always needs to precede exploration and that often exploration by students is a waste of time when they can more efficiently just be subject to an explanation from a, uh, from a knowledgeable teacher. Uh, and my, my general understanding of pedagogy and particularly of where innovations in pedagogy are occurring are in a, a much more flexible middle ground where somewhere exploration sometimes needs to precede explanation, where a, an opportunity, opportunities to think first, to grapple, to struggle with something which is just beyond your current level of understanding has been shown in many uh, well-controlled experimental studies to be predictive of deeper and longer lasting learning and uh, greater, uh, higher levels of performance um, in certain kinds of tests and also are more compatible with the development of the kinds of mental habits or dispositions that I was talking about on the previous slide, the development of curiosity, of creativity, uh, of resilience, of uh, attentional control, uh, and so on and so on. So let's have a look at what some of these uh, assumptions are that have been around. Um, they were first really put together and promoted by a book, what, the first of a series of books that have been very influential in shaping opinion in the last few years in education. Um, and probably the first one was Daisy Christodoulou's Christa book, Seven Myths About Education, but there, there have been many others. So I, I want to make it clear that what I'm, my, what, what I'm uh, critiquing um, is not necessarily the professional practice or even the current opinions of these authors. It's what they said in their books, which has been, which have been widely disseminated and which have had a powerful influence. I think undermining the professional self-confidence of teachers to work in the middle ground to, to, to explore different ways and different circumstances in which exploration by students blends in with, in a much more nuanced way with explanation by teachers. So a few of these assumptions are, are this, that the mind is basically, is, is well depicted by the model of the digital computer. Follows from this, that memorization, that there's a lot of concern with the nature of working memory and uh, with the implications of this model of the mind for what's called cognitive load. Um, and are often uh, 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 it is taken as if this emphasis on memory was also a justification for the importance in, in uh, classrooms of memorization. The, the strong version of direct instruction play, has, has relied a lot, has, a lot of the rhetoric has been on the importance of memorization. The idea that knowledge is made up of a lot of little, what I call factlets, sort of independent facts, which can be learned independently and then just stored in your long-term memory. The idea that you have to teach facts before students can begin to think. The idea 
uh, has gained some ground, that students are in some sense intellectual novices, that they don't know enough to be able to think, that in order to be able to think about something, you have first to know a lot about the subject. Um, and therefore it is, it is somewhere in between impossible and irresponsible to treat students as people who can engage thoughtfully or quizzically or experimentally with knowledge before they've mastered uncritically a vast amount of knowledge. Uh, there is an argument that there's no such thing as these as generic mental skills. We'll, we'll come back to that. Although the mood has shifted uh, since um, E.D. Hirsch uh, made that claim very strongly some 20, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, the idea that you can disregard skills or dispositions and just teach content, that it is a, a, actually a possibility in the classroom not to be involved with the development of epistemic character, um, as these traits are sometimes called. The idea that developing learning dispositions competes for time, energy and attention with teaching knowledge, that these are, there's some, kind of, some essential tug of war, incompatibility between these two sense of objectives uh, is an idea that has been promoted rather widely. Um, and most fundamentally, really, the idea that there's only two kinds of teaching. There's direct instruction with rather extreme form of traditional teaching and something that's often called pure discovery or minimally, minimally guided discovery. Well, let's take a very quick look. Um, the mind is like a computer. If you take the back of a computer, you will indeed see separate components. You'll find uh, uh, the motherboard, you'll find a central processing unit, you'll find a RAM, you'll find uh, a, a hard disk. And this in the 1960s, when I was doing my undergraduate and postgraduate studies in cognitive psychology, was taken as a very juicy working metaphor for the mind. And, and it's become enshrined in education. Here's a model taken from one of Daniel, Daniel Willingham's books, um, which boils this model down to the barest, the barest bones, working memory, which is taken as being the site of awareness and thinking and assertion itself, which is very uh, tendentious in cognitive psychology, I would have to say. Um, and long-term memory, which stores factual knowledge and procedural knowledge. Notice that Willington, Willingham refers to this as just about the simplest model of the mind possible. And I think the majority of cognitive psychologists would say oversimplified, misleading in its, in its simplicity. I'm reminded of the famous quote attributed to Albert Einstein, who said, we should endeavor to make things as simple as possible, but not more so. And this is a model which in many people's minds is not cast in stone and uh, beyond reproach, but is uh, actually um, very misleading when it comes to thinking about uh, what's going on. Here's a quote, I and mean, we don't have time to go into the details here, they're all, they're all in the book, uh, but here's a quote from a, a rather influential um, a commentator in the US saying very trenchantly, this, computers quite literally process information. Computers quite literally move these patterns of information from place to place, physical place to place in different physical storage areas. Sometimes they transform them in various ways. We don't, human beings don't, we're made of carbon, not silicon. We don't store them, note the, the italics, the picking out the metaphors here. We don't store them in a short-term memory buffer and then transfer them into a long-term memory device. We don't retrieve information from memory registers. This image, this metaphor for mind is now uh, it's somewhere between highly disputed and largely discredited or even ignored now uh, in cognitive psychology. I mean, as, as in any movement in any science, there, are, there are continue to be streams of research that follow this model. But in general, in my reading of the cognitive science, uh, it's not that it is no longer the dominant model of mind. Computers do all these things, but organisms do not. The idea that humans must be viewed as information processors is just on the model of the digital computer is just plain silly. We're organisms, not computers. Get over it. 
So we have, we, that leads us on to thinking about this idea that memorization, that the whole apparatus of working memory and cognitive load. A lot of people seem to use the word memory a lot. They like talking about getting things into long-term memory you know, and getting things through working memory. And it reads, if you read between the lines, one of the reasons why the notion of memory is so popular, because there is a confusion between memory and memorization, between memory as a hypothetical store, memories as hypothetical contents of that store, and memorizing as the process whereby those contents get into the store. But of course, this completely ignores comprehensions, completely ignores understanding, which is what most of us are designed to do and born to do. We have to keep reminding ourselves, as many cognitive science commentators do routinely, that, that this store image of memory is itself just a metaphor, just as this idea, this much widely used idea of, um, uh, of the architecture, the fundamental architecture of cognition is also a metaphor. The concept of architecture makes you think of the, a structure like the Parthenon that is stayed relatively stable and unchanged for 2000 years. Um, so it, it, it gives you, it, it, it invites you to buy that model of the architecture of cognition, invites you to buy into something that is monolithic, that structural, static and unchanging, like these, there is a working memory, and everything has to go through it and so on. But working memory, if we dispute this metaphor as people do, working memory isn't a place. It now, it now is widely seen very differently because we've shifted the root metaphor from the metaphor of boxes and stores into models that are couched much more in, in the jargon of the trade, conceptual nervous system language. That is to say, round about the 1980s, even before actually, I mean, we're way back to an influential book published in 1949, um, when I was two years old. Um, the, the, the idea that we should create our psychological models uh, uh, we, our psychological models should be constrained by what we know about the functioning of the brain has gained currency so that it is now quite every day. So working memory is not a separate box in the head. It's not a place. It's a temporary pattern of activation and inhibition across the memory networks, what you might call, there is nothing but long-term memory. There are no boxes in the brain. Current models of working memory are based much more around the idea of what this concept comes from, from the AI research, a much more soft assembled. That's to say different bits of the brain are activated, co-activated, are talking with each other in ways that are assembled moment by moment in the light of the current tasks that you're being asked to do. They're not monolithic structures that sit inside your head. Now, when you make that shift to a very different kind of language, very different implications emerge. And certainly the idea that we have to be continually worried about squeezing information through this narrow channel of, of short-term memory or working memory doesn't obtain. Those limits appear only under very specific conditions. For example, when the elements that you're having to learn don't fit together quickly and naturally. In other words, when comprehension, which is our natural mode of addressing the world, when comprehension is stymied by the nature of the learning task, then you may have to do something different with your brain, but that's not what you're doing most of the time. Um, the idea that maths and science equations where these, this particular kind of problem solving, where you have to hold in mind different elements of a problem that cannot yet be integrated. You have to, as it were, juggle with separate mental elements. That appears more in certain kinds of, not broad, not ubiquitously, even in maths and science, but certain kinds of maths and science learning and teaching. The, the, those models are not uh, accurate prototypes for what goes on across the rest of the curriculum. They're, they don't capture the kind of thinking, the kind of understanding, the kind of discussing, the kind of uh, value-based discussions, the kinds of disagreements that are the lifeblood of an English class 
uh, or a history class or a drama class, or which might be the different ways in which information is being used in a PE class or a design technology class. Uh, so the, there, the, 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 it is a mistake to take maths and science as prototypical of the whole curriculum. They require very particular, uh, at certain points, very particular kinds of learning. Um, and this is a kind of learning that only intermittently applies to normal complex uh, human affairs. We must remember that the whole body of research on which working memory rests was designed way back in the 1890s, uh, specifically to on the basis of experiments that required people to remember strings of things that didn't make sense, strings of random digits or strings of random words or strings of so-called nonsense syllables, which were little things like pav or I still, talk or oh, talk's not a good example because we have TikTok these days, but things that at the time were, de were explicitly designed to, to, to prevent you from doing what the brain normally does, which is to, to, in real time, whilst you're acquiring information, to build it into a working model, which can then, in terms of what you already know, which can then be refined and critiqued and developed and so on. That's the natural mode um, of the mode, of, the, of, the, of the, way, the way the brain works. So the whole basis of this working memory uh, short, long-term, short-term memory model uh, comes from a very curious kind of branch of, uh, of experimentation. So now we can see that knowledge may be occasionally under some strange circumstances made up of, of isolated facts, but it's actually much more, knowledge grows much more like a tree. Twigs grow out of branches, branch, branches grow out of the, 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 the trunk of the tree. That's our natural way of functioning. What the mind is built to do is to go looking for this connectivity. And then it has to do something rather odd when it can't find connectivity. It's a bit like some of the assumptions are that, that you have to kind of fill kids' heads with facts and then somehow or other magically understanding or even critical thinking will emerge from this enormous mass of, of independent knowledge units inside your head strikes me as a bit like supposing that if you you know you order enough lorry loads of bricks and have them dumped in your front garden at some point when the pile is big enough these bricks will automatically or organize themselves into a well-designed house um, it's about as it makes about as much sense to suppose to argue that we have to fill kids heads with with uncritically uh, acquired knowledge um, facts are not much use without understanding or often they're, they're often just kind of, you know, element, what do I do with them? You know, they're useful for quizzes and game shows and maybe holding your own at high table or at a dinner party. But there are all kinds of practical things that we need to do in the world um, for which that kind of knowledge, that kind of granular factually based knowledge um, is, not, uh, is not ideal. Yet you have people like, and I could give uh, dozens and dozens of quotes. Tom Bennett in one of his early books saying, I suspect that children learn when they're told stuff and forced in some way to remember it and practice it. I mean, that is the model, the, the sort of the simplistic model of teaching at its, at its crudest. The idea that you have to teach lots of facts um, before students can begin to think and discuss, even in, even in uh, as I've said, only operates in certain arcane worlds even in the, the realms of science and mathematics, there is a lot of recent work um, uh, around what's called embodied cognition, which shows that metaphors and often embodied metaphors, metaphors that have to do with our embodied living in the world and with the, the evidence of our senses are absolutely the lifeblood. We, we kickstart, we jumpstart our understanding of new and strange domains by taking a metaphor like the computer metaphor of memory or Plato took the memory of, a, of, a, of an aviary with birds locked up in different compartments and then use it to generate ideas and to pick apart. We don't learn things literally. Um, I, I've always rather liked this quote from Werner Heisenberg, one of the fathers of, of, of quantum theory talking about Niels Bohr 
um, who originated the, the solar system model of the, of the atom, saying Bohr has formed an intuitive picture of the atom, an intuitive picture of the atom, which he can only convey to other physicists by such inadequate means as electron orbits and quantum conditions. It's not at all certain that Bohr himself believes that electrons revolve inside the atom. In other words, these are not facts. These are not, these are theories to be worked with, to be interrogated, to be used to generate uh, new experiments or new conjectures or new insights. Um, and that's much more at the heart of, uh, of what we're, uh, of, of the, the, the common understanding these days. Of, of how the brain and how the, how, how the mind works. The idea that there's no such things as generic skills, really, I mean, Daniel William, Willingham um, uh, and, Her and Hirsch did subscribe to this idea that somehow there was something kind of paradoxical or silly or ridiculous about, about the idea that, that there were the domain general skillful knowledge, but Willingham uh, recanted on this in 2017 so he said, uh, he put his hands up and said, yep, I've been very skeptical of the idea of 21st century skills, uh, but research like research, very elegant research by Sam Weinberg and his colleagues have shown that I was wrong. There are useful content free strategies that make a big difference in student assessment, for example, of website accuracy. There are things that can be taught, that can be learned, that can be cultivated. There are habits of mind, which we can, if we have a mind to, be coached and cultivated in our classrooms. Skills, skills. so it's not that we teach. You see, the, the problem is with the word teaching. You don't teach these skills. You, you'll notice I've been using words like train or coach or cultivate. They are habits of mind, like physical habits which grow over time as we learn to use our minds and to develop our mental equipment in certain kinds of ways. Um, and we now know quite a lot about the kind of pedagogy that generates these, uh, these kinds of skills or dispositions is a, is a more accurate word. So some explicit training, some talking about them is useful, but, but that doesn't do it on itself. Practice in diverse contexts, what David Perkins calls playing away from home um, with, with whatever, you, whatever you've learned, helps your skillful, your mental skills to become more disembedded. It's not that we can plop generic skills into young people's heads, but we can help them. They arrive wrapped in certain kinds of context, certain kinds of subject matter, and through certain kinds of teaching, we can help them to, as it were, break through the shell of that wrapping in which it arrived, and we can become more conscious, we can become more flexible in the way in which we can make use of those mental skills and, and dispositions. Particular activities where new transfer can be discovered by youngsters and deliberate coaching. So there is now a, a good literature showing that these things are possible. Even the idea that was presented that, that, that you can be completely, you can completely ignore this silly nonsense about mental skills and just teach, uh, just teach knowledge is something which now come, has, has come under a lot of questioning. I mean, uh, to make a very long story short, you can teach history plus empathizing, plus learning to put yourself in the shoes of other people. These boys in a secondary school in Cardiff are wearing what they call their empathy specs, which are a seriously playful way of helping them to write about a historical episode, which they've been learning about through the eyes of different characters. This deepens their historical knowledge, but it also helps to foreground in, as I say, a seriously playful way, the fact that part of the exercise of what they're doing is helping them develop their ability to adopt multiple perspectives. Or you can teach history plus credulity, plus there is one true story and this is it. You can teach fractions in a way that builds confidence and skill in mental experimentation, or you can teach fractions plus a growing fear of making mistakes and an a, a unwillingness to try out things on your own, but to sit and wait passively to be told how to do it. And so on, you can teach magnets plus curiosity, or you can teach magnets plus passivity. These are hark back to my idea of results plus. You can teach reading plus pleasure of reading, or you can teach reading 
plus aversion to reading. So what people are looking for around the world is what are the elements of pedagogy which enable us to build the simultaneously with the, with the acquisition and the critiquing of knowledge, simultaneously, like in, in different layers of learning that are going on at the same time, to help us build dispositions which by general acclaim are positive, are empowering, uh, for young people as they embark on life through university and beyond, where goodness knows they're going to need to be entrepreneurial and self-organizing uh, and persevering and so on. Um, we need to be thinking more carefully about what the effects are of our pedagogies on this underlying shaping of mental habits. Um, I sometimes depict this as being a little bit like the, the layers of flow in a river. Imagine this picture as being the, the, a, a cross section of a river with knowledge fairly visible on the top, skills and disciplinary expertise um, a, a little lower down, but down at the bottom of the river where things change more slowly and where it's, it's harder to keep your eye on what's going on down there. But it's also where the big fish are, is where these underlying um, complementary dispositions are being generated and that's where the pedagogical action is as I read the situation around the world where people are looking for how do we adjust the mood music of the classroom how do we configure the activities that we offer to our students so that in the very process of engaging with these activities of being in a in a situation where um, experimentation and perseverance and critical discussion are being invited and strengthened and shaped and refined by what's going on in the classroom. We can achieve both those targets at once. We can achieve the knowledge acquisition, the rigor and the grades, and at the same time, we can knowingly and systematically be helping youngsters develop the aspects of thinking which will stand them in better stead in the big wide world. So now we have to get beyond really this hyper polarized idea that there are only two types of teaching. I've put on, on this slide, the, the, the front page of a paper which um, many, many of you will have read, which has been very powerful, published way back in 2006, which illustrates the title of this paper, illustrates the kind of hyper polarization of the debate why minimal guidance during instruction does not work. No ifs, no buts, no sometimes, or for some people, or when does it, or doesn't it, when doesn't it, or how, how, could, it, how could it be nuanced, and what do we mean by minimal? No, it does not work. That's the, that's the claim, the upfront claim of this paper. An analysis of the failure, the failure. Again, you know, there's no quibble with that. If you buy this model of the mind, then you have to buy this hyperpolarized model which says beyond shadow of a doubt, we cognitive scientists have shown that anything that has any whiff of constructivist, discovery learning, problem-based learning, experiential learning, inquiry-based learning, anything that has any whiff of exploration as well as explanation is bunk is debarred. It's been shown by science not to work, to handicap the already uh, handicapped children, to disadvantage the already disadvantaged children. It's like these are incredibly strong claims which rely on the model of the mind, which we have just been seeing is uh, subject to all kinds of critiques. So, you know, as most of you know, you know, as 99%, 95% of the teaching profession know, it, when you're in a classroom working with a group of kids, your teaching style changes. You are responsive. With some groups, you can give them something tricky to work on that is going to be quite challenging and give them time to flounder productively with that, um, with that material before you set about explaining, but not floundering unproductively. 
you design well what are called in, in many of these schools grapple problems, which are well designed by a teacher who knows her class well enough to be able to design a problem that is just beyond what they could currently do easily or intuitively, but not so far beyond that they don't know how to do it. And many of these schools now uh, are, are working in that kind of way. You build up students' competence, even using words like grapple or do you want to try something tricky today, helps to build a culture in which the children see that these are not threats to their self-esteem, but these are challenges that are going to help their, to use another metaphor, their mental musculature grow and become more skillful in the way that any athlete engages with physical challenges, works at their limit and beyond in order to grow their, uh, their physical skill um, and, their, uh, and their physical strength and physical stamina. Yet this, this, this kind of argument, argumentation undermines teachers' confidence of their, the, where their professional expertise lies is in inhabiting and learning how to operate in this middle ground. It's sophisticated teaching and it's not easy. Some people have got their fingers burnt when they tried to be too quote unquote progressive too quickly. And instead of concluding that they misjudged the, le the, the level of maturity of their group, or that they didn't pitch it right, or that they have something to learn as a teacher, no, some of them have concluded that any kind of progressive or constructive or problem-based teaching doesn't work on the basis of their unfortunate uh, experience. So, you know, I think that's where we can see this alliance of the cognitive scientists and some of the some of the writers in this area may be finding their synergy. So a good teacher, good teaching depends on audience, topic, mood, energy, depends on what you're doing. The, the, to ask the question what works in teaching is to ask a foolish, foolish question, because you cannot answer that question until you first are answered works for what. Teaching that works for short term gains in maths and science, on maths and science tests, that kind of teaching may be effective for producing those short term gains. And a lot of the research literature is built around the short term gains on instructional tests. But the self same teaching is not optimal if you also are interested in developing independence of mind. Um, the ability to be a good discussant and a good collaborator when you're working together on a tricky, tricky problem and your ability to persist in the face of difficulty. What is a good pedagogy for one educational aim becomes not, not, not self-obviously a good pedagogy when you add in other valued aims as well. So direct instruction may work well, when some kind of strong framing is needed, when the subject is abstract or students are, lack the basis of self-regulation in the classroom, or when only conventional test scores are counted. But the, the research shows there are real costs in terms of curiosity, creativity, and persistence. Um, I'm just reading this paper uh, at the moment. You may be able to see it. The title of this paper published in 20, uh, uh, earlier this year, is children persist less when adults take over. In other words, too much bossiness by teachers, too much teachers doing all the work to frame, to organize, to explain upfront, deprives children of the ability and the motivation to persist in the face of difficulty themselves. It undermines that, um, that disposition. So really there are, there are you know, we, we, we need to, as it were, rethink our assumptions or reclaim what, what for many teachers has been their accurate, intuitive understanding. The mind doesn't work like a computer, like a, like a computer. Memorization uh, is not necessary in order to mitigate the cognitive load on working memory, except under certain highly specific conditions. Knowledge is not made up of lots of little factlets. Uh, you don't have to teach facts before students can begin to think. There are such things as generic mental skills, or at least 
there are things that we can do in the classroom to help mental skills become more generic, to become more transferable. You can't just disregard skills in the classroom. Even if you're the most traditional maths teacher on the planet, you're still teaching adding fractions plus being concerned only with the right answer or um, sitting there waiting to be rescued when you're, uh, when, when you're getting into difficulty. You can't disregard what's going on down at the bottom of the river. Developing learning dispositions can perfectly well carry on uh, in alignment with, um, uh, with teaching and transferring knowledge. That opposition is false, unnecessary and damaging. And certainly the fact that there's only two types of teaching is something that we really need to sweep away. Um, and when we've done that, hopefully this log jam, this dam that has been, I think, holding back some of the necessary and exciting innovation that is going on in many schools around the world, but in many other schools, there is a sense of being too timid, or too cautious, too oppressed by, the, um, by political or bureaucratic masters who've bought into this so-called knowledge rich and you know nothing to do with direct skills that model hopefully the profession can reclaim its ingenuity its uh, sophistication um, and contribute to this worldwide quest to find a genuinely all-round multivalent pedagogy that will suit all kids to the challenges of life in the 21st century Thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you very much indeed, Guy. Um, um, we are just up against, uh, just beyond five o'clock, but I, I wonder whether there's time just for a couple of questions, if you have a moment. Uh, yes, be... yes, of course I do. I'm sorry I went on right. too long. No, 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 it's wonderful and really, really interesting. Um, uh, I have a question from uh, Jess here on, on, the, on Slido. How can we, or do we need to measure teacher success against their ability to instill these so-called softer skills in students to avoid exam factories? The idea of measuring teacher success, I mean, I'm, I, I don't know if I'm reading the question right, but if it's phrased in terms of, you know, teachers' salary increments or, you know, something or other, if that kind of punitive framework, I think would be completely abhorrent. Um, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, teachers have to buy in, teachers have to understand, teachers have to own the fact that this is an exciting adventure in pedagogy where they have things to learn and cheerfully so, and can be involved uh, in a community of teachers who are uh, imaginatively sharing, supporting, you know, school leadership is obviously critical uh, mm. in this area. So I would much rather talk about the importance of trying, one of our recent books is a book for school principals about how to generate this culture uh, in, a, in, a, in a school, powering up your school, the learning power approach to school leadership. Um, and it's lots of real life stories from people who've done it, school leaders who've done it, uh, pour encourager les autres, to help other school leaders feel that this is A, valid, but B, doable, and there are eminently practical things that we can do to build that positive, supportive culture in a school. So I would sh shy away, as you can tell, from using language like measuring teachers' success at doing this. But mm -hmm. I think offering a more encouraging framework, saying, don't we all want kids to, you know, to be able to flourish in unfamiliar and challenging contexts out in the real wide world? Well, you know, there are positive signs which might help you do that in your own classroom. I'd much rather frame it that way. Thank you. Um, I, I, I can't, I don't have time to answer all the questions, but I'll pick out one or two. Um, there's a question sure. here. Um, knowledge is still important, especially in subjects in science. Yes, I've can't, said that many, many times, haven't you? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Can, can you encourage, or can't you encourage metacognition skills around knowledge? And I might add, um, uh, my own experience visiting a, uh, a couple of schools in particular where the, uh, the demonstration of metacognitive development and metacognitive skills in the students was really, really apparent in the way they talked about their learning. But I'm, I'm certainly curious. Yeah, your... yeah abso abso absolutely. I mean, meta I'm not a huge fan of the concept of metacognition. 
because from a, from a cognitive science point of view, it's about seven different things rolled into one muddle. Um, but I, I'm very interested in the gr a student's growing ability to ask themselves productive questions when they're finding learning difficult. Mm. That's one specific version of metacognition. And the way to grow that is through coaching the development of productive talk between students in the classroom. Mm. One of the most prescient scientists in this area, uh, working a long time ago, Vygotsky, a name that many people encountered in their teacher training, uh, put it very simply. He said, what becomes our own mental equipment is first learned in the interactions with other people. Mm -hmm. So we need to be creating classrooms where there is plenty of time for productive grapple talk between students, where the quality of that talk is constantly being deliberately, explicitly coached and developed, structured by the teacher. And then in that process where two kids are getting together saying, I don't know, we, we seem to be a bit stuck on this. What could we do? To, you know, are we making any assumptions that are stopping us thinking? Where, what resources could we use? Where else could we go to get a good idea? So is it, does this remind us of anything? As they throw those questions at each other in the course of that collaboration, so those questions begin to get installed in your own mental um, software inside yeah. your own head. And that's, and I think that's a very simple, obvious, straightforward, practical, useful way of talking about metacognition. All right, thank you. And, and just to follow up uh, that from um, the concept of, of, of the, the term coaching, there's uh, an awful lot of misunderstanding and misrepresentation of what, what the word coaching actually means. Uh, and, and I yeah. think, um, I think, you know, uh, we we can use it in the sense that you have in in terms of the, the specific development of 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 skills and attributes and knowledge you know in a particular domain, and we can yeah. use coaching in its purest form, um, which is a, a, a different thing. And I'm, I'm I'm curious what you think about that. Yeah, I'm uh, I I'm I'm a bit confused about what I think about coaching. I don't wholeheartedly like the way in which the word coaching seems to have been appropriated by life yeah. coaches um, as, if, as if there was only one legitimate model of coaching in which you weren't allowed to tell or train or mm. lead people at all, as if somehow this was sort of philosophically illegitimate. And there is like, so it's more, there's like an extreme wing of the coaching world, which is perhaps analogous, like the mirror image of the extreme wing of the, traditional pedagogy world, if you like. Mm. I, I, I tend to use the word coaching. I, I find the metaphor between developing our mental skill, skill our mental mm. dispositions, our ability, our, our mental equipment, our mental software, mm. and sports coaching, good old fashioned sports coaching, you know, Andy Murray's coach, mm. or, uh, you know, mm. I'm trying to remember that Joe yeah. Roots coach or yeah. whoever, right? You know, they have some authority. They have some knowledge. Their yeah. job is to encourage, to support and co-create with their athletes stretching activities, which yeah. will, which in endeavoring to pursue them or achieve them will grow and stretch and strengthen and develop their capability. Mm. Yeah. So I think I use coaching in that very yeah. grounded, very straightforward yeah. sense. And I, I know there is enormous value in the other sense of coaching, but I dispute their right to, to, to ideologically claim the word mm. as, as a, <laughs> and, and sort of tick people off if they used it differently. Yeah, sure. And and, and there, there's there's quite a body of um, people in, in, in the middle of that who would use um all the different words that you use to describe those different forms of helping and uh, an interaction actually quite specifically so so Absolutely. yes we yes we coach and we mentor and we advise and we tell and we explain and we instruct and, yeah. and all of those those things so yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so my, my, my my argument is only it's with simpletons of of, yeah. of whatever persuasion <laughs> i think <laughs> uh, people, that might people be... try and persuade us that it's that life is a lot simpler than it really yeah. is yeah <laughs> 
That might be um, an appropriate time at which to end. I'm, I'm being told that I need to um, sure. close up before the next one. But if I could just, uh, on everyone's behalf, not that anyone can uh, uh, see or hear each other, but if on, on everyone's behalf, I could thank you very much indeed, Guy, for a really informative uh, talk. And um, uh, I, I know that everyone will have appreciated it. Thank you. Good. Pleasure. Thank, and thank you for your, for your support and for your questions here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. It's my great honour to welcome you all. It is a very prestigious award. It means the world to me. They have great senses of humour. I like to reveal parts of history to them for. I love making history come alive. They are some of the best people that you can come across. To help them open their hearts. I always come back to this quote. How can we be role models to learners if we're not learners ourselves? It's quite useful to get out of our bubbles, not our COVID ones, and sort of see what else is out there. By sharing best practice, we can see the whole picture. We can see what really matters. It's easy to forget how much has to happen behind the front line. As a global schools group, Cognita educates over 55,000 students across 12 countries. We're proud to be wellbeing partner at this year's Festival of Education and we want to share the work that we're doing to prioritise children's well-being. This starts with a clear understanding of what well-being is. We looked at the evidence and created a simple Be Well Charter that everyone can use day to day. It gives a clear definition of well-being and then focuses on the specific contributors that influence it. Discover our full Be Well Charter video and other resources to use with your students and families at cognita.com. I really try to not look at myself as just a science teacher. I feel like as a teacher, it's, it's very important to help students grow and develop outside of your lessons. A single teacher believing in you and really believing in you. One teacher doing that can have a large impact, but if you have one or two or three all telling you that and really, really believing in it, it makes you feel like you can achieve anything in the world, honestly.